This morning, we're going to be in our uh, Bible text is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, second half of uh, verse 14 through to the end of the chapter. And I invite you to take your Bibles and uh, we'll read that together. Second, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 9, 14b through 26. Let's give our attention to God's word being read. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel, but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For I do this out of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will... I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. law, Not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do not do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is God's word. We're grateful for it. I invite you to pray with me as we ask for the Lord's help in this time. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Uh, Thank you for speaking. Thank you for speaking and and speaking through prophets and apostles and thank you for uh, ensuring through your spirit that these words have been written down for us. They are for us and you call men to preach. And while I'm just a messenger, um, we ask for a supernatural work even now to happen, that your spirit would take the true living active word, living an active word, your word, and apply it to our hearts. That what may be accomplished in us is exactly what you intend as your word says your word does not return void so that's what we want to happen this morning so help each of us to be conscious of that to be mindful that you are working in us that you're going to use a mere man to speak truth and i pray that we will hear from you and we ask this all through the name of jesus amen Uh, back on uh, labor day uh, kathy and i decided to celebrate our 39th wedding anniversary and we took an overnight getaway in kansas city it was great because i had enough points so that the room was practically free uh, they let us check in early and were able to use the outdoor pool. After sitting there and getting beat by the heat for a while, I, I wanted a Gatorade, so I went to that ki- kiosk next to the pool and, and I pulled out my credit card to pay and it says, no charge, your system's down. I thought, great, <laughs> great. It was just all good. I mean, practically free room, free Gatorade. Who doesn't love free stuff, right? But you know, as I was thinking about it, is it really free? I mean, I got the points because I'd stayed in that hotel chain before and it was just really an accident that I didn't have to pay for my Gatorade. But really, there isn't anything truly free, nothing at least worthwhile. That is, except for the gospel. And that's what we're talking about today. So as I studied the scripture, I thought, well, what's the purpose of this? Not just to Corinth, there's a purpose to them, but to us today course this applies it's been written down for us now paul here in this text he's writing about his own ministry and i think in part he's defending his apostolic ministry he's had to do that already 
But what is him, Paul, the apostle, telling the Corinthians about what he does and what he has to do and what he does not do? What does that have to do with local churches everywhere and in every time? That's the question I was asking this. Now, there's certainly one way to approach this is to look at Paul, look at him as as an example, and so emulate him, right? So then, two gospel preachers, pastors, be like Paul, forego financial support, try to eliminate cultural barriers, be an athlete, be focused. Now, of course, what that does is introduces a little bit of attention, and you can just see it because he just told the Corinthians that churches should support their pastors. So, do we follow Paul's words or his example? Now, clearly, there's, there's got to be a larger point. There aren't any apostles today, and while God calls pastors, shepherds, evangelists to preach, Not all believers are called to be gospel preachers like pastors and like apostles. Certainly we're we're called to share. We're called to be ready to give an answer. But this unique task that the Apostle Paul is talking about regarding him. So I ask the question, what about everyone else? It's not explicitly stated here in the text, but I, I think there's a broader application for the church by implication. And here it is. I'll set it up with this sentence. The principles that are guiding the Apostle Paul's ministry are, by implication, the principles that should apply to the ministry of the local church. So this passage isn't primarily about getting paid or not getting paid to preach the gospel. This is about the importance and form and effect of the church's gospel ministry. And here's my outline for this morning in one sentence, three points encapsulated in one sentence. The gospel is a compelling message for everyone, so let's stay focused. The gospel, point one, the gospel is a compelling message, point two, for everyone, three, so let's stay focused focused. First of all, the gospel is a compelling message. Now, why is it that we do anything at all? Now, some things are coerced and some things are compelled. Now, I know, I know these words are practically synonymous, but I want to illustrate, I want to explain how I'm using these words differently for the purposes of my illustration. So, on April 15th uh, next year, I'm going to have to write yet another check to the IRS. Now, why do I do that? Not because I'm delighted to do so. Not because I think the government is a particularly good steward of the money we send. No, I'm required by law. That law forces my behavior. I'm coerced by the threat of a consequence if I do not pay my taxes. We are all in the same boat. It's coerced. That's why I do it. If I was given an option by the government, I probably wouldn't. I think there would be a better way, right? but I'm not given that option. Alternatively, many of us routinely give to support this ministry. Why? Well, well for me, I'm not forced. There's no one looking at my budget. There's no one looking at my bank transactions, but rather I'm compelled. I'm motivated by the fact that the money isn't mine in the first place, and I want my church to have the resources necessary to carry out the ministry. So for my illustrative purposes, I'm compelled to do something because of the intrinsic value of doing it, which is different than a coercion. There's an intrinsic value that that I feel. And the gospel is like that. It's a compelling message. Now, as we look at the text here, after affirming the Lord's command that those who proclaim the gospel should be supported by the church, what he then does is give his reason for not using that support, right? He's not using that right. Verses 15 through 17. Now, if you tracked with me and read in your own Bibles, you can see these are difficult on the surface. And as I studied it, it was like commentators are all over the map in terms of what he means. But as I distill this down, it looks like that he, uh, you know, on the surface, you know, you don't want to make the mistake that he is advocating somehow for his own pride, in not exercising the right. Look at me. It's not it. Paul uses that word boasting as 
that which is worthy of glorifying, worthy of lifting up. So by boasting that he didn't receive support, by glorifying that, I think what he's doing for the Corinthians is undermining a false view that they have in Corinth. He's undermining some false view. And I think part of that false view they had was that the, the, the message was not authoritative if the preacher wasn't paid. You're not receiving paycheck. We're not receiving our support. Therefore, this is not apostolic. Therefore, what you have to say is not really valuable. Connected to it, that the gospel preaching is really boils, I should say, really boils down to a business transaction. And Paul say, says he would rather die than they would think such things. His ground for boasting is his insistence that the gospel will be preached with or without the support of the local church. And he also wanted them to understand that the message of the gospel was not to be used for some other personal benefit. Now, we look at verse 16. Paul says that preaching itself, the fact that he, he's a gospel preacher, he's declaring Christ, right? That gives him no ground for boasting. There's no glory in that. He's not, it's like he's saying, it's not as if I'm making some kind of great sacrifice in doing this. What he's saying is he's compelled by the fact that he was called to be a steward of a message that comes from the Lord, verse 17. He's a steward of something. So we could take it this way. He can't help but preach. And he says this, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. The word woe, that's grief. He would be deeply grieved if he did not preach. So there's no external compulsion here. Internally, it's like, I have to do this. See, in declaring the gospel, he's simply telling about the intrinsic goodness of the message about Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not set aside, setting aside the fact that call, Paul was indeed called to preach. There's a divine compelling, but that motivation became internal for him because it was the Holy Spirit moving him. The Holy Spirit who, who initially opened his eyes and opened his heart to see the intrinsic and eternal value of the good news about Jesus Christ. You see, before he was even called to preach, he was called to to Christ in repentance. He was called to be forgiven. He was called to be counted righteous in God's sight. He was called to be promised an eternal inheritance in Christ. That's before preaching. The understanding of what had been accomplished in his own life was first. So for Paul, the very nature of having believed the good news about Christ compels them to preach it. Now, for Paul, and this should be for us too, the gospel is compelling in two ways. First of all, and I'm reaching into other parts of Paul's epistles, first of all, it is the power of God. And I'm going to take you to Romans 1, 16, 17. This is what he writes there, describing the gospel. It is, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He's saying it is the power of God. This gospel, this good news about Jesus Christ, it's a story it is news, but it's unlike any other news, any other story, because it's not merely information. It's not passive. You see, because this is the Holy Spirit breathed out word, because it is living and active, as it says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God, this gospel story, acts on hearers. The gospel story is the power of God because it acts upon hearers that the Holy Spirit awakens to life. That is everyone who believes. So it's not passive. That's why it's compelling. But the second way that the gospel is compelling is the active nature of the, mo uh, of the message itself. 
It's compelling in that the active nature of the message itself motivates its proclamation. He understands its power, is what I'm saying. So, just a simple, dumb example. If you want your car to take you down the road, you got to put the gas in it, right? So it would be absurd to pr pretend somehow you could move forward any other way. So if the means of people being saved is hearing the gospel, why would he not preach it? It's the power of God. The power of God is that message about the eternal Son of God taking on human flesh, living that pristine life of obedience to the law of God, dying in the place of sinners, rising again to grant eternal life to everyone who trusts in him, believing that message. You know you have an advocate at the right hand of the Father, Christ himself. Now, before he went to the cross, Jesus described how he would save people. And again, this just adds more um, depth to the understanding of the powerful nature of the gospel. Jesus said this in John 12. It's one of my favorites. He said, And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. John comments, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And Jesus says, and I, when I'm lifted up, will draw all people to myself. Now, there's a play on words here, I believe. To be lifted up is certainly to be exalted, to be glorified. But the idea of being lifted up, that's a euphemism for a, a public execution. So Jesus says when he is lifted up, publicly executed, he will draw all people to himself. So, when we exalt Jesus in that he was lifted up, the one who was publicly executed, he draws people to himself. That's the compelling power of the gospel. Now, Paul insisted that the gospel must be freely given. Brothers and sisters, we've got to know this. We've got to know this. The ultimate aim of the gospel is to glorify Christ who through his sacrifice brings lost people into fellowship with God. That is how he is glorified. He takes people who are enemies, he dies in their place, and he brings them into this close fellowship with God. The gospel is not the means to some other ends. Now you might be thinking, well, of course not. How could the church get this wrong? We think about our time. We still enjoy a great deal of favor in the West as the church. There are huge churches. Evangelicalism is a, is a significant American subculture with some measure of power. I think that idea would have been foreign in the Apostle Paul's time. So here's how the church could get this wrong, that the ministry itself becomes a platform for fame in the evangelical world. So here's how, the, how, the, how this works. More people believing, more people added to the church. Good, good, both good. Glory for the leaders, mm, sinful motivation. Glory then for the church members to think, look how great our church is thinking maybe that they become superior. And listen, I, this is, I don't know the pastor of this church, so I'm going to risk offense. A new church pops up in a community. They say their name is relevant. By implication, the other church around the corner is irrelevant, right? It's like, hey, we're better. Listen, I'm not, that may be unkind, but that's what comes to mind. It's like, why? Why do you need that name? Last week, I, I watched a, a video by a former megachurch pastor. He said, many churches become more concerned about winning people to their brand than to Christ. And this happens. It, it's a megachurch idea, but it, a lot of churches are infected by the same kind of thinking. 
when a church has developed brand loyalty, what they can do is slowly and even unwittingly chip away at the biblical convictions of its members. I'll just give you a historical example, okay? So, think back before the Reformation. Loyalty to the Roman Catholic Church by its members allowed the hierarchy to get away with selling indulgences, money paid to get people out of purgatory. Now, that continues to some degree today. The Pope is able to make pronouncements that we look at and go, I don't think that's quite biblical, which undermine biblical truths. Now, when those who are beholden to the Roman Catholic Church are told there is only one true church and you abandon it at your peril, now you've been embracing something that isn't true and you've got brand loyalty without Christ loyalty. And that continues today. And again, I was looking, watching this video from this former megachurch pastor. He says that many churches following the example do the same. They demand loyalty to the brand over, over Christ. And what they do because of the acceptance and the brand loyalty, what starts to fade away is the importance of repentance in following Christ. And sadly, I've met many people who are part of these kinds of churches, faithful church members who, who are living in ways, immoral ways, completely unaware, completely unaware that the Bible speaks against that. So the true gospel may be proclaimed, that's good, but it then just becomes a means to another end. And we should never, never sell the gospel as a means for our own personal glory. The Apostle Paul says, I would rather die than do that. So, the gospel must be freely proclaimed. And as we apply it to ourselves, woe to us, woe to us at Overland Hills Church if we do not preach the gospel. Woe to us if we do not build this ministry around the gospel. Woe to us if we make the gospel secondary to politics or social action, social justice. Woe to us if every time we gather like this, we're not lifting up Christ. Woe to us if we do not seek to raise up men who will also be able to preach. May we ever hold to what the Apostle Paul described in chapter two, verse two. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The gospel is a compelling message and it is for everyone it is for everyone racism of course is a sin and that sin dehumanizes another based on cultural differences the pigment of their skin melanin now it's not a concept we see explicitly addressed in scripture though it should be obviously understood when reading the creation story, man, no cultural or skin color exception was created in the image of God. We get that. Now, even if people don't dehumanize others because of these differences, there still remains a reality that we all deal with. There's a sociological reality of in-group favoritism. This is normal human behavior. It's normal because it's the path of least social resistance it exists. That least social resistance path exists among those who share your values, understand your habits. And all we have to do to, for the proof of that is take our, our, our immediate families, right? It's the circle of trust. You have shorthand in your immediate family. You have shorthand in your extended family. There is shorthand in your culture. There is shorthand, right? This happens. These concentric circles, common language, culture, region, nation, etc. That's in-group favoritism. We all do it. It isn't racist. It's just comfortable. Conversation, business partnerships, team projects are all easier when the members understand the shorthand. So you know this, right? If you've got a project to build a deck, you'll likely call your own brothers in the business long before you consider anyone else. No one thinks this is sinful. Now, whether it's 
sinful racism or just simple practical in-group favoritism, the Apostle Paul says, as it regards the gospel, we prioritize the person over our personal affinity. We have to recognize these things. We prioritize the person made in the image of God over any personal affinity. The Apostle Paul describes his own. We can see this in verses 19 through, 19 through 22. He declares that he is a servant to all to win more of them. Now, of course, that means by means of the gospel, right? And his aim that by all means, all means I might save some. That's verse 22. So what does that mean? He explains it. Paul says he became as a Jew and like those under the law. That's verse 20. Then he became as one outside the law, meaning non-Jews, Gentiles. He became one as, he became as a weak person, verse 22. So what's essential for the gospel that cultural difference not be a barrier. Socioeconomic difference not be a barrier. Now that didn't mean he had to adopt a different culture to reach them. Verse 19, he said, I am free from all. But it also didn't mean he had to abandon his gospel convictions either. Verse 20, he says, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. And then the parenthetical statement, though not being myself under the law. In other words, I'm not adopting that. I'm not living like that. So there's some relational thing that he is considering here that do, means that he doesn't have to embrace the culture itself or the values. You see, Paul wasn't going to enslave himself again to the traditions of Judaism for the sake of reaching Jews. That would, in fact, be a condemnable corruption of the gospel. And all you have to do is refer to the letter of Galatians. When Paul says, I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some, he's not saying that he abandons anything at all of his gospel convictions. But what I take here is that he holds out no reason, no reason, cultural, linguistic, the moral weakness on the part of the hearer as a reason not to seek out some common ground as an opportunity for the gospel. So when Paul speaks with a Jew, he doesn't begin by just denigrating the entire Jewish tradition, which he came from. When he engages with a pagan or somebody who's morally weak, he does not avoid them because he is repulsed by their idolatry or their moral laxity. He doesn't just write them off it's like that. It's the mindset that no one is beyond saving, and he seeks common ground for the gospel. And because the gospel is truly compelling, he knows, he knows that when someone truly believes the gospel, someone truly surrenders to Christ as Lord, repents of their sin and turns to him, he knows they will abandon everything that is antithetical to following Christ. So how might this apply to the church today? Now, we understand that, that some aspects of different cultures are morally neutral. We know that to be true. Language, how people dress, all kinds of customs. But certainly there are some aspects of other cultures that are not morally neutral. If a cultural custom involves praying to dead relatives, that's idolatry. And so we don't leave people in a culture that denies Christ. But on the other hand, we must not use cultural differences and in-group favoritism as an excuse to exclude anyone at all from the gospel. Now, what do I mean here? In the 1970s, this is a little bit of his church history stuff, uh, there was a missiologist named Donald McGavern he wrote a very influential book called Understanding Church Growth. And in that book, he describes something he called the homogeneous unit principle. And for those theology and church history geeks, you know what I'm talking about. But, but what he observed was effectively this, that churches grow, this is practically, you add more people, when you appeal to a particular 
cultural subgroup, and that could be ethnocultural, socioeconomic, etc. Now, I think his intentions were good, but I think what he did was he raised the value of those affinities over the gospel. Another missiologist follow him, Peter Wagner. He defended McGavern's principle in this book called Your Church Can Grow. A lot of people bought that book. A lot of church leaders bought that book. This is what he wrote. Cultures in virtually every corner of the world confirms that the churches most likely to grow are those which bring together in the local fellowship those of a single homogeneous unit. Now, it's highly pragmatic. It gets uh, people in the seats. I was going to say it in a kind of a crass way, but you know what I'm saying. It gets people in the seats. But it ultimately, I believe, undermines the gospel. Because the glue, ultimately, that holds that fellowship together is something other than Christ. That's the problem with it. And so this gave rise to the suburban professional churches, hip-hop churches, cowboy churches, sports churches, and whatever other subgroup. The glue isn't Christ. And that's antithetical to the vision that John has of the whole people of God in Revelation, surrounding the throne, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, stand before the throne, before the Lamb. We can't put affinity over Christ. The gospel needs to be the glue. Second, this isn't easy. We become all things to all people. And here I'm preaching to myself. What does it mean for us as a church to become all things to all people? Like I say, not easy, and I, I thought deeply about this. Paul says become like the Jew, become like the, the pagan, like the weak. For us in this culture, in this nation, I think we become like the immigrant who walked across the border and we acknowledge his desire to make a better life for his family. Now, you have opinions about the legality of crossing our border, but there is a person created in the image of God. What's the most important thing in that conversation? We become like the Palestinian Arab. and We acknowledge that the conflict and violence in Israel left him displaced and embittered. You may have opinions about the war in Gaza and Hamas and Hezbollah and the Palestinian plight and Justice, just war. But there's an individual created the image of God. What's the first thing you're concerned about? We become like the LGBT activist. Again, I know I'm, there's a landmine here. Acknowledge the desire for community and acceptance without clear, without affirming sin, and like I said, a social minefield. I don't think we can participate in the pronoun lies, but I don't think we can be boorish and impolite. An individual twisted by sin to be sure still created in the image of God. So what's our attitude when such persons walk into our church? What's our attitude when we cross paths? And I, like I say, I'm preaching to myself because I know, I know my defaults. And against this passage of Scripture, they're kind of ugly. I have to fight this. What's our attitude? Are they other? Or are they someone that Christ may redeem? Our attitude must be that we see ourselves individually and collectively as servants, that by all means we might win some. And Paul's motivation needs to be our motivation. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Our aim, because of the love of Christ for them, because of the joy of forgiveness, because of the grace of being counted righteous in God's sight, our aim is that we seek for all people to know Christ. And Bob focused on this this morning in the Sunday school class in here. Sharing the gospel in a winsome way, being ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you, doing that with gentleness and 
respect. Well, third, the gospel is a compelling message for all people, so stay focused. Um, some of you know that I run. I like, I run. I say I like to run. I, do I like it? I'll, not, not usually when I start, but I, I like the end result. I like health. But all the way along, I am tempted to quit. I'm tempted to stop because it is hard. But I know I'm going to feel better. I know my cardiologist says it's good for me. Now, I don't run to compete with anyone. I'm slow. My prize is simply maintaining good health. That's my aim. Now, in verses 24 to 27, we, we, Paul is using two different sports to illustrate his point about the gospel, about the focus on that. Verse 24, run to win the prize. Verse 26, you don't just box to beat the air. You actually, you're training for a real fight, a boxing match. And both of these things involve discipline. Part of that discipline is focus. What is the prize of this discipline and focus? Paul says, an imperishable wreath. The runner gets this fading wreath, this garland, and it's going to go away. But we're, we're running for an imperishable wreath, an eternal reward. That reward, he has already said, is sharing in the very blessings of the gospel. So, to ensure that he is not disqualified from the race, the contest, Paul maintains discipline and focus, he says, to keep his body under control. Now, certainly for him, and certainly for all of us, is the avoidance of sinful temptations that would destroy our witness. But that also meant deciding between what's permissible and what's essential. There's lots of things that are permissible, but what is essential? So when you run a race, you don't stop for a plate of pancakes, right? Nothing wrong with pancakes. But it's not going to get you to the end, right? It's a distraction. It's permissible, but you're not going to win the race. More than that, it's keeping the gospel that Paul preaches in his own sights. See, I, I'm confident of this. Paul knows that he'll never outgrow his need for the gospel. He will never be beyond the reminder that Jesus died for his sins and rose again. He must never forget that keeping Christ at the center of everything is the way that he can be effective. So what is the application for the church? We must keep focused. And that involves discipline. So how do we, wh what's the form of that discipline? Well, we must keep our focus on Christ. We must understand that we never outgrow the gospel. We never outgrow hearing about Jesus and who he is and what he accomplished at his cross and that he rose again and is seated at the right hand of God. We never outgrow needing to know that. Many years ago, I was criticized for my preaching. A dear saint, he wanted, he wanted more practical application and, and to his credit, I needed to work on more application, but, but he didn't want to be repeatedly told that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. I thought that was unnecessary. I don't remember his exact words, but he criticized me in this way. I already bought the car. Tell me how to drive it. Or tell me something I don't know. It might have been either one of those. So, more practical steps. Love your wife this way. Discipline your children this way. Just stop sinning. Try harder. Do better. Now, there's a place for application. But when it's not grounded in the gospel, it's just legalism. When I truly came to understand the power of the gospel, I realized, I realized that looking to Jesus and his cross is the way that we lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely so that we can run with endurance the race that is set before us. It is in looking to Jesus, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It is in beholding the glory of the Lord. Where do we behold that? In the gospel of Christ, in that gospel message. Beholding that, it is in beholding that that we are transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. So for our own sake, as a church, individually, collectively, when we gather, we sing the word of Christ, we pray the word of Christ, we preach the word of Christ. That is the absolute best thing we can do. And part of that discipline is to keep our focus and not be distracted by something good 
that replaces what is best. There are a lot of good causes in the world, but the church is the only place that has the stewardship of the gospel. The apostle Paul wrote to Timothy about the church. The church of the living God is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Nowhere else in the world, no other organization or institution on the planet is given that explanation. The church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, in Paul's day, the common practice of slavery, it was ubiquitous. Certainly a moral evil. And no doubt Paul wanted to be free from it. He wanted all to be free. But you know, you read through the New Testament, it was not his aim to motivate churches to abolish it. And in a sense, he even acquiesced to it. Likewise, we don't have to contend with that today. We should not be distracted from what is best by something good. Political action about abortion, gender-affirming care, tax policy protecting the First and Second Amendments, things that matter, good things perhaps, some will raise others above others. Now that might be your job citizen in this world and I would think those are good things I, I'm sure God cares about the flourishing of all people but what's our job what's our job when we gather I'm convinced that when someone when anyone surrenders to the Lord Jesus Christ they won't want to abort their babies they won't give their children puberty blockers. They will seek what is just in the world. Transformed lives transform nations. Our mission is transformed lives through the gospel of Christ. Abortion is a moral evil but we're not going to come here on a Sunday morning, gather together, invite a politician, and, and whip up the pro-life agenda. It's good. But it's a plate of pancakes on a race. It's not the best thing. Well, let me wrap this up. The best thing for the world is absolutely free. And we, the church, offer it freely to all. It's a compelling message for everyone. So let's stay focused on lifting up Christ that he may draw all people to himself. Let's pray. Father, I feel um, some particular rebukes against my own attitudes. Um, I pray for all of us that you would make us a, um, a people who love the gospel more than anything else, love the gospel more than our freedoms in this nation, love the gospel more than seeing the government change, love the gospel because we love Christ. Lord, I pray that you would um, help us never to trade away the gospel for some lesser reward that we would see it's for everyone and that we would keep focused on exalting Jesus and we know when we do that he draws all people to himself empower us by your spirit to do just that for Christ's glory we pray it amen